Welcome to the Thursday, August 29th, 2019 version of Clemson Dubcast. Woke up at four this morning. Couldn't sleep. Wonder why. Oh, oh yeah. Game day. Just typed up the final thoughts on the opener. Sent them in to master publisher Chris Ard. Also have up on the website at tigerillustrated.com right now story on what the massive assistant coach turnover in the ACC has meant. 49 new assistant coaches this year in the ACC. Of course, zero at Clemson. Also plenty of excellent recruiting coverage as usual from Paul Strelo, who will be at the game. Plenty of post-game analysis and a look ahead, of course, to next week's showdown. Does it qualify as that? I guess so. With Texas A&M at Death Valley. Title sponsor of the Clemson Dubcast, Harm Smith Arts and Hole Law Firm in downtown Greenville. They have been with us from the very beginning. Blake Smith has been a good friend of mine for years, dating back to the days when he taught a law class at Clemson with Terry Don Phillips, also Brooke Arch and Hold, major Clemson fans. The forte of their firm, which is at 15 Washington Park in Greenville, is medical negligence. They represent patients and their families in medical negligence actions, also handle all sorts of other personal injury litigation. Free consultations, Parham Smith and Arch and Hold. Give them a call, 864 990 45 or go to parhamlaw.com. want to welcome aboard to the podcast Black Acre Law Firm, sister law firm of Parham Smith and Archenhold in Greenville. Stuart James is a 1998 Clemson grad, big Clemson fan, just like the Parham Smith and Archenhold family. Black Acre gives you the representation you can depend on when you're on the home stretch, closing on your house. All those documents you're signing, all those technical aspects of it, the last thing you want is, is for something to go wrong at that point. Black Acre also provides services for Will, powers of attorney, durable, and health care. Don't put yourself and your family in a bad situation by not having these important documents. Call today for a consultation, 864-775-5400, or go to their website, blackacrelawfirm.com. That's B-L-A-C-K-A-C-R-E, lawfirm.com. All right, let's get to our sit-down with Dan Radakovich. This has been in the works for quite some time, kind of a different presentation than the normal interview trying to cover all the nuts and bolts and, hey, what's this update on contracts and facilities and all that? This is more about Dan the person. Long overdue, actually, and, and really it's my fault for not uh, having an interview that tells us more about Dan Radakovich, the person, his background, and all that. And he has quite an interesting background, as we documented earlier this week in an article at TigerIllustrated.com. So here we go. The extended sit-down with Dan Radakovich. Enjoy. <laughs> Joined by Dan Radakovich. Uh, not a whole lot going going on this Friday. A uh, couple of couple of days ago, classes started. You got a Thursday uh, opener coming up. Busy well, man. Well, it's always good to see you, Larry, and thanks for the opportunity to be on the podcast. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on here. It's one of those uh, times when everybody, uh, you know, has their assignments. You know, whether it's John Allen in game management, Owen Godfrey with our tickets. You know, Davis. Bab and Ipte, and certainly Dabo and the entire football operation. But you know, we we're blessed with an incredible staff, and and they're doing their work and getting ready to uh, welcome about eighty thousand people to campus uh, next Thursday when we take on the Yellow Jackets. What is this like for you with so much going on? The ACC Network, um, some of the changes with the metal detectors and things like that. Is it something that's really front and center in your mind right now or is the hay kind of in the barn to to a degree well two very different things certainly the metal detectors and and the entry into the stadium is something that that we have and uh, a lot more control over than the acc network but you know we've been working with chief mullen i mean it started a year ago when we had our pilot program at various gates during the course of the year we learned an awful lot uh we learned that if you're on the north side of the stadium there's no way that we could have metal detectors without closing the road Road. So that decision was made in late January, kind of moved forward through our board of trustees, alerted them, uh, alerted IPTE and the folks that were affected parking wise, uh, started some work in, in parking lot number five, which is between the stadium and perimeter road, made 100 new spaces. So we kind of uh, were on par with the spaces lost to the spaces gained. So that was really helpful and, and important for us. Uh, but then we started to work with some security consultants is the best way to move people through those lines and 
understanding that closing that road, we couldn't do it completely because we we obviously have to move the buses from the locker room up to the rock. So we've created a travel lane in there for the buses, for the band who always does a pregame deal. So we wanted to make sure that a lot of the pregame uh, rituals and traditions that were there uh, were still going to be taken into account and and we can do and I think we've accomplished that now uh, we're going to be better in gate th- in game three than we will be in game one as it relates to people getting into the stadium but I think our communication staff has done an outstanding job over the summer you know letting people know about this change how how they can come into the stadium maybe leave their tailgate a few minutes earlier to, to get in uh, but we bought all new uh, metal detectors. Uh, It'll be hopefully a seamless process to get a number of people in. And one of the things I'd I'd love everybody to know is if you've gone into a certain gate like forever, uh, make sure you just kind of see, well, maybe another gate would be easier for you to get in. Um, because there still will be some backups at certain areas just because of the physical layout of the stadium. But if you went in on the Avenue of Champions side, the north side of the stadium, and you sit on the south, you can certainly walk through the Oculus and get to the south and and, and be at your your seat in, in plenty of time for kickoff. So, th- like I said, it'll be better in Game 3 than Game 1, but here we go. We're, we're ready. Before we started this interview, we were talking about uh, the visit that, that Dabo Sweeney made uh, last October over here to the McFadden building, a different McFadden building now than it, than it was then, obviously. And um, you really helped out with one of the best anecdotes of the whole sort of series that we did on his 10-year anniversary by saying, hey, check out this the bottom of this drawer where, where you had Dabo, I guess, scrawled or, or, or dug his name into the bottom of it. Had to have been back in 2008 when right. he was auditioning for the job. Well, first of all, when did you discover that? <laughs> well, it was really early on. I mean, the, the office that we're sitting in now in the McFadden building is, and, and it seems like this has been the hopscotch over the years, uh, wherever the head football coach was and they moved into new offices, whether it was Jervy to McFadden, McFadden to the West End Zone, and the athletic administration would kind of take over that area. So the AD took over the head football coach's office. So the office we're sitting in was uh, manned for a period of time by um, Tommy Bowden and, of course, Dabo. Well, I opened the desk drawer one of the first days that I'm here, and I just see Dabo's signature on it. And it reminded me that um, when presidents leave office, they leave an envelope for whoever succeeds them. And I've always wondered what's in that letter. Um, Like, good luck. Uh, You wanted this kind of a deal. (laughs) But, uh, you know, I saw that with Dabo. You came over and did that. I wanted to make sure you saw it and he saw it. And uh, then as we started the renovation here at McFadden, uh, I took a Sharpie and went on the opposite side of the drawer and signed my <laughs> name. And uh, some lucky staff member throughout our, our building now has that desk. And uh, hopefully they'll put their name in it, too, uh, whenever they um, leave Clemson. Oh, so it's still here. It's just in some other office it's somewhere. It's still here. I, I don't know where it is. We uh, we could put an APB out on it <laughs> and uh, and find it. But it is a, it is an important part of, of, of history. And, and Dabo remembered it right right away when he, when he saw it. He said, I left my mark. And I, I guess my interpretation of it at the time, which was so cool, was at that time, the, the thought that it, that it occurred to him to do that when he was so busy with obviously trying to win a job. Sure. But he was saying, I, I interpreted it as, as you know, whether he, whether he fizzled and, and, and they brought another coach in and he was never anything beyond the interim coach or whether he turned into a coach who's, who wins two national titles in three years, he was going to let people know he was there, you know? Absolutely. Was that your same sort of, I guess, yeah, impression? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, know, with, with, you know, with his signature and where he's been able to come, I just kind of want to be a footnote. So I, <laughs> I signed the other side of it because, you know, he's done such a fantastic job here. Dan, I probably, over the t- years that I've been covering you, probably haven't done a, a very good job of, of getting, allowing people to get to know you as a person. Um, every almost every interview we do is more nuts and bolts. Okay, what's going on here? What's next with with, with this? So I really 
am looking at this as, as an opportunity uh, to sort of tell people more about you, the person. So I guess we can start at the beginning, growing up in Western Pennsylvania, Aliquippa, am I, I guess, yeah. it was, or outside of Aliquippa? Just or? outside. It, you know, the way it is, it's, it, it's not unlike Central and Clemson and Seneca. It's kind of all one area. And you know, while people around the country might not know where Central is, so you might say, hey, I'm from Clemson, yeah. because they know where that is. But Aliquippa was the town where the, the major employer was, Jones and Lachlan Steel. My town was just a little north, Center Township, which you know it had its own high school and the whole deal, but it was really a suburb of where that uh, biggest employer of the county was. It was a great time to grow up in in just north of Pittsburgh. This this whole area is about 25 miles north of Pittsburgh because in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, that was when the Pirates and the Steelers and University of Pittsburgh and Penn State were all doing really great things. And athletics was always very important, you know, growing up in that area because it was a steel town and high school football was, it was Friday Night Lights before Friday Night Lights uh, got popular. Um, and, and it was just, you know, a, a great way to um, not only represent your town, but uh, grow. Um, a, as a person, and I'm very, very fortunate to have grown up there. Your father, Dan Senior, was a diesel mechanic for Jones and Jones and Lachlan. Lachlan. Yes. Uh, what were those hours like? What, what do you remember from that? Well, it was interesting when it, when you work in the steel mill. Uh, there's usually three shifts because the steel mill worked 24 hours a day. You either work 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., or 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. So the the way the schedule worked is he would uh, work two of those daylight shifts, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., followed by a week of the middle shift of 3 to 11, followed by a week of the midnight shift from 11 to 7. So as you looked at a calendar, whether it was an athletic calendar or, you know, things going on personally in the family, you kind of got to know pretty quickly, okay, well, what's, how's dad working that that week. Mm -hmm. Um, So my mom was a homemaker, um, so she didn't work. So it was just my dad, my mom, my sister, and myself. And my sister was six years younger than me. So it was um, was really kind of interesting. Um, And a lot of family around the area. And that always always made holidays a lot of fun. Your grandfather lived next door. He did. He immigrated to the U.S. around 1910 from Yugoslavia to look for work on the railroads. There have to be some cool details from those stories that, that you were told growing up. Well, you know, my grandfather was really a, a very, very smart guy. His his job at the railroad was, you know, kind of doing a lot of the weighing in of, of you know, whatever was in the railroad cars and, and, and documenting that stuff. And part of the reason was he had the most beautiful handwriting for someone who didn't grow up in the United States that I've ever seen. And he was very meticulous with numbers. Probably the, the reason that I got into numbers is, a, is it related to high school, college, and then my career beyond, because he was always the, the treasurer of whatever organization he was involved in. So uh, he, was, he was a fantastic uh, guy. It was great to have him next door chickens, garden, you know, the whole deal. And uh, it was just, it was a lot of fun. Your mother is one of 13 children, father, one of six. So those family... I told you I had a lot of family. Family (laughs) get-togethers. What do you... That must have been a, those must have been uh, epic affairs. They were, and and uh, a few weeks ago, my dad um, is, is still alive. He uh, still lo- lives in Pittsburgh, and and I went up to visit him uh, in July, and we went on a little trip. And I, I had to go to my aunt's house because it was my mother's sister, and she would host everyone during the holidays. And you know, growing up, you you didn't really understand how many people were were in a house. And then when you just started to think about all those number of people and their children and friends, you're probably talking about 45, 50, 60 people at a time inside one of these row houses in a, <laughs> in a steel town. So I just had to drive by and see exactly how everybody would have fit in there. And my dad's sitting in the car, he goes, what are you doing? And I go, well, I just, I just need to be able to figure out how all these people got into that house. And he goes, uh, well, let me just tell you, uh, they all fit, and uh, it was really crowded. <laughs> <laughs> how much, I mean, I, I know that just from watching, from being around Clemson and, and seeing you know, kids 
friends' kids grow sure. up around this pro- football program and, and the profile it's enjoying, how, you know, you know how much it shapes them. How much did being around such successful sports teams in your area shape you uh, as you moved on? Well, it, it was always something that I, I thought that if I was ever lucky enough to be able to actually make a living and have a career in athletics, it would be phenomenal. Um, you know, I had a, a when I went to Indiana University of Pennsylvania, uh, the, the athletic director there always kind of I, I got to know him real well, Herm Sledzik, and he would involve me in a few things. We just got to be good friends and, and got to see what his job was. And then I said, you know, I'm probably going to go into the business world for a while. But I had an opportunity to go to the University of Miami to get an MBA. This was 1980. Um, The economy wasn't real good. um, And the opportunity to go out into the working world or continue in education was was really kind of a crossroads. And I had a couple of job offers to stay in Pittsburgh. And I often think that had I taken that road, um, I would have probably maintained you know, some residents in and around the area where I grew up probably would have coached high school football, probably would have been involved in those kind of things. And it would have been a very nice, neat, kind of simple existence. But I I ended up going to the University of Miami, um, getting my MBA and and beginning on this, um, going down that road and being being here today. And I read somewhere you thought you were going to, at one point, you thought you were going to run a hospital one day? Yeah, it, it, that was actually the concentration for my, uh, for my MBA was healthcare administration. And, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of parallels between running a hospital and running an athletic department. I really didn't realize this until a few years ago. You know, in a hospital, you have your facility area, you have your billing area, you have your admissions. And in an athletic department, you have your facilities area, you have your business office, you have your ticket office, you have, um, you know, your doctors and your your coaches. You know, the the really high level neurosurgeons probably are a little bit different tact of, than your uh, you know, internal medicine folks, and you know, you got to deal with different people, just like you have to deal with different coaches along the way. So, um, yeah, I think that that I, I kind of ended up in the same place, except it's uh, doesn't have ambulances running around. <laughs> so you're at Miami. Uh, when they win the national title mm-hmm. under Howard Schnellenberger, I guess just a few years about after they were going to shut the program down. And then he leaves abruptly to go to the USFL, I guess to be president, uh, GM, and coach. And then in comes some guy named Jimmy Johnson. I'm just curious, you being a fly on the wall uh, down there at that time, what, what your recollections are about, about that whole period? Well, it was really done just before Memorial Day weekend uh, of 1984. And uh, my role uh, was, you know, really to kind of keep coaches, you know, from airport to the interview room where the where the athletic director at that time and the president and a couple of people within uh, the Hurricane Club board of trustee people were interviewing them and then making sure that they got tours and all those sorts of things. And it was um, it was really kind of interesting. I, I made a lot of stops to Miami International Airport <laughs> that, that weekend and really kind of set a schedule for everybody kind of coming in and making sure they met with the right folks and had a great experience while they were um, there that weekend. So I um, uh, interestingly, Jimmy was not one of the people who came in that weekend. Later on that week, uh, after Memorial Day, there was a um, a coaches convention, and our athletic director Sam Jankovich went there and actually met Jimmy in an elevator. And Jimmy said, "You know, I hear you got a job open, and I'd really be the guy. I'm the guy who you should hire." And that's how he and Sam began to have a dialogue, and they went and they interviewed and. Uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Johnson was at Oklahoma State. He was at Oklahoma State. I get, has the statute of limitations for privacy or confidentiality run out in, in the however many years since then? Can you tell me who else you guys interviewed? Well, I th- yeah, I, I think uh, you know we we talked to Ed Emery, um, who uh, was the coach at East Carolina. Uh, we talked to um, I forget his first name McIntyre, who was the coach at Vanderbilt. Uh, Al Kincaid, who was at Wyoming, uh, Dave McLean, 
who is at the University of of, Wisco- of Wisconsin. Wonderful guy. Um, you know, he he was he was kind of interesting. I really enjoyed the opportunity to interact with him. Uh, so those are the ones I think I remember. Those are the ones I remember off the top of my head. How much have coaching searches and the desire to keep them uh, private? How much have they changed over the in the decades since? Well, I th- yeah, they've they've changed a lot because you know people didn't have iPhones to snap pictures or you know those kind of things. That, oh, follow tail numbers on airplanes. I mean, shoot, these guys all came in on commercial air airliners. Um, so it was it was it's very different now, and I think that that's probably the reason a lot of places in order to keep confidentiality of both the search and and the candidates utilize um, search firms for very very high level coaching uh, searches because they not only want to protect their own uh, confidentiality as they go down the path of trying to find the right fit for their particular uh, opening but they also want to protect the people who are who are interested and in in the job and the reasons for interest are um as as different as everyone's fingerprint i mean you would never think some folks are interested in a job they have a great job but it it might be that they have a uncle or a cousin or family or whatever you know in and around the area they love to hunt and fish and where they are they don't get that opportunity i mean just whatever reason you can think of that's that could be the catalyst why somebody is interested in a job. Big supporter of the Clemson Dubcast is Harris Flooring America, based in Anderson, South Carolina. Harris Flooring has been instrumental in a lot of the facilities transformation you've seen on Clemson's campus lately, from the Allen Reeves Center to the McFadden Building to Memorial Stadium to the Neary Center, family-owned and operated since 1947. The owner, Scott Junkins, big Clemson guy. Harris Flooring is just as good inside the home and the residential realm as they are with the larger scale commercial stuff. Give them a call 864-642-6183 or online at flooringamerica-anderson.com. Also sponsoring the Dubcast is the Abernathy Boutique Hotel. A short Trevor Lawrence throw from Death Valley. Man, it is a favorite for the ESPN folks who come into town who stay there various times of the year. Also, man, it is booked up and packed to the gills for uh, home football weekends. It is really caught on for people who want to come in and stay. Also, Taps Bar and Cafe, a really cool spot to go hang out during the week. If you want to grab a drink uh, with some friends, some of you professors out there who want to wind down after work, laid back alternative to some of the more boisterous college bars in downtown Clemson. So go check them out if you already haven't. Got some really good beers on tap, including my favorite, the Hugie Street IPA. So check them out online at theabernathy.com. With Jimmy Johnson, I think I read where you said the two things that impressed you most about him were his enthusiasm and his organizational abilities. Is that? Yeah, it, absolutely. And but, but Jimmy was a, a great motivator as well. Uh, he was an industrial psychology major at, at the University of Arkansas, and y- you could really see that at play not only at the University of Miami where, where he was, but then later on during his time with the Cowboys. And you know, he was just he was just he's a he's a great guy, and you know, really um, loves life, and he loved it then, and he loves it now out on his boat three rings in <laughs> um, Key West. So for you, from eighty six to eighty nine, you were you, you left Miami. Were you you were in banking? Is that right? I was in banking. Okay. Uh, I, I you know you, I was I came out of my MBA. I was in the business world. Went to University of Miami for a few years. Didn't really know that if that was going to be my niche. Went back out into the business world for a few years, and then was lucky enough to um, get the job at Long Beach State in the late eighties. And and when I was there, uh, really. Uh, decided at that point in time collegiate athletics is what I wanted to do. How did you end up at Long Beach? One of the guys who was on staff at the University of Miami became the athletic director at Long, at Long Beach State. And he called me and said, look, I'd really like for you to come and work here, run the business office, and, and really kind of help me um, 
because you know there was there was that connection between some of the things that we had both done together at the University of Miami. So Corey Johnson, uh, who later became the AD at um, Colorado State and worked at UCF and Nova Southeastern, uh, was the guy who brought me out to um, to Long Beach. Five years out there, you have both your boys. Out they were, there, they were both born in uh, Hogue Hospital in uh, Newport Beach, and Hogue Hospital uh, should be a tourist attraction because most of the rooms in that hospital overlook the Pacific Ocean. Mm-hmm. It's one of the most beautiful <laughs> places I've ever been. Uh, I guess another important part of that stint was you, you're developing a friendship with the late Mike McGee, who was the AD at Southern Cal. How did that come about? Well, it was, it, it, that certainly was the time that that happened. Um, Mike um, had been a great football coach for a number of years, uh, was let go at, I, I believe Duke uh, was the school that um, had, had let him go, but he had a year left on his contract. So he went to North Carolina and got his PhD. And part of his PhD he, he used his football background and he said, you know, we do all of these seminars and, and things for young and upcoming coaches. And thinking that he was going to get into athletic administration, he, there, there was nothing like that at the time to help prepare young administrators. So Mike does that as his PhD dissertation. He then gets the AD job at Cincinnati the following year, was there for a couple of years, and then went to the University of Southern California. And after getting established there, he kind of pulled that off the shelf, and you know he had gotten to know the athletic director at Notre Dame at the time, and certainly John Swafford at North Carolina. And the three of them got together, really with Mike's um, leadership, to say, hey, look, why don't we start a, a, a program for people who are interested in athletic administration and take them out to one of our campuses for a couple of weeks in the summer and then bring them to another campus for a week in the winter and expose them to people on the campus who are marketing experts, finance experts, HR experts, motivation, leadership, all those kind of things. So that's what he did. He started the Sports Management Institute. And I was lucky enough to be in the second class um, that they had had, uh, along with people like Dick Bedore, who was the longtime AD at North Carolina. Bubba Cunningham uh, was was in my class. Uh, Lisa Love, who had been the athletic director at Arizona State for a number of years. So uh, a lot of athletic administrators who are sitting in in chairs today uh, can look on their resume and you'll find uh, a time at the Sports Management Institute. So he's at South Carolina, and he calls you and asks you to come run the business side of, of things right. there. He does, and, and, and I, I totally give uh, – there are two reasons why I went from Long Beach to the University of South Carolina. One was the Northridge earthquake uh, that happened about <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> two days before I was ready to go out there. My wife, Marcy, uh, who's always been incredibly supportive, she, she said, look, you know, however you want to do this, this is fine. Uh, I'm leaving to go and hit LAX for the red eye flight down there. And she stops me at the door at, two days after this earthquake. She goes, You better get this job. <laughs> um, and then Mike came out and visited us. Uh, he wanted to meet Marcy. And Marcy was, uh, at that point in time, I think eight and a half months pregnant with Grant, our son that ended up playing football here. Um, and Mike loved children. I mean, he had five and I think the number was 17 grandchildren. I mean, just loved kids. And uh, I think he hired me because Marcy was getting ready to have a baby. <laughs> All right. So that's that's 94 to 2000, correct? Right. All right. I'm th- off the top of my head, Brad Scott hire? Brad Scott um, was uh, there. He had, he had been hired a couple of months before I got okay. there. So he was the football coach. Eddie Fogler was the basketball coach. Uh, June Raines was the baseball coach for a while. And then in came this Tanner guy. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, I guess you're there for the Lou Holtz yes. hire. Uh-huh. Can you give a fly on the wall account of, of how that all that went down? You know, it was interesting. You know, Mike really... Um, wanted Brad to succeed a lot. I mean, um, he, he was 
he was really invested in Brad, and it was one. Of the, it was the hardest thing that he ever did was making that change. And and he talked to a lot of folks, and 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 certainly let me know. He goes, "I'm never firing another football coach." He goes, "I'm mm-hmm. going to hire one more." And I guess he was thinking that he was going to retire at that point in time. Uh, he ended up hiring one more, which was Steve Spurrier, but. Uh, Coach Holtz was somebody who, yeah, I'm going to take the job, but then I'm not going to take the job, and then I'm going to take the job, and then I'm not going to take the job. So that kind of seesawed for a little while, but in the end, Mike was able to convince him that this was that South Carolina would be a good spot for him, and that he could come in and make a difference. Are you involved in that in any way? Or is he the the point man? Mike uh, Mike was pretty much a one man search search crew. Um, you know, he gave all of us who were a part of his organization great responsibility. Um, but that one was his and his alone. Um, he didn't really utilize uh, a lot of us to do that now as it related to facility projects, other big difference makers within the department. He would allow someone like Chris, who's at Chris Massaro, who's at Middle Tennessee, or myself, or Lori Massa, who has been an athletic director for a long while, Jeff Barber, who ran um, the uh, Gamecock Club, gave us great latitude and, and, and the ability to, to do things. But the football hire, Mike looked around the department, and as a former Outland Trophy winner and head football coach himself, he said, you know what? There's nobody in this department that knows more about this than me, so I'll handle it myself. So is he, uh, like at the end of every day, is he coming and sharing, like, the la- you know, the latest with, with, with you and, and some others saying, okay, I don't think he's going to come? Like the- uh, there were times when he would call, and he would say, look, I don't think he's coming. Why don't you call this guy and see if they can come in for an interview. And then kind of a nod to the ping pong, um, I made a call to Jim Hazlitt, Hmm. who at that point in time was the defensive coordinator of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I get Jim off the practice field because Jim and I had played college football together at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And Jim was kind of rising up the ranks and uh, really it, it was good, good timing. So, Mike calls and says, "Hey, call Jim, see if he's if he'd like to come down and 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 uh, have an interview." So I go up, get Jim off the practice field. Hey, Jim, this is you know, check your schedule, see if you come down, hang up, goes down to Mike and say, "Look, I think Jim can come on. I don't know Thursday." And he goes, well, forget it. Call him back. Lou Holtz is coming. <laughs> so, so like a day later, Lou Holtz, we have, we have the big deal in, in the, in the, um, stadium, in the right? stadium, you know, his, his kickoff. And I had to call Jim and say, Jim, false alarm. So it was just one of those things. But as football coaches, they all, they all get that and understand it. Who else did you talk to? I don't, you know, it's interesting. I figured as you, as I was giving that story that you would ask me that. And, and I, those are the, only two people that I remember, Coach Holtz and 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 um, and Jim, kind of in in reserve. So you don't have any idea. He may have talked to a bunch of people, yeah. but like I said, this was this was a little. This was Mike and Mike alone. I'm just wondering if you know had you know had Holtz said no, who who would who the who the guy would have been? Ah, that's don't that's know. a great question. So you go to to American as the AD for a cup of coffee, I guess eight mm-hmm. or nine months. Yeah, and I, that was my um, I'm getting impatient phase of being an athletic administrator. You know, I'd interviewed for a couple of AD jobs, and and the one that I really um, kind of thought I had an opportunity at was the University of North Carolina Wilmington. Um, really good thing I didn't get that because you know for the upcoming ten years, Wilmington just got battered by every hurricane that came up the yeah. eastern seaboard. But uh, didn't get that job. Got back and 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 got to know a couple of people at American and went up there and got the job. So that, it was fun for eight or nine months to be up there. And um, you know I always say that you know I kind of won the lottery when I was at American University. First of all, got to to know a number of really, really good people um, that continue to be friends today. Um, But at that point in time, uh, Skip Burtman became the athletic director at at LSU. Mark Emmert, who's now the president of the NCAA, was the president there, or chancellor. And uh, through mutual friends, Ray Tanner being one of them, uh, said, you know, Skip's really looking for someone to come in and help run the day-to-day operations. So I was lucky enough to go down there and interview, and it was it was a great 
um, weekend in Baton Rouge. I spent a lot of time with Skip, a lot of time with Mark Emmert because, you know, Mark had, had just hired Skip as his athletic director. So he was incredibly invested in making sure that the organization around Skip, because Skip has incredible talents in motivation, leadership, organization, all those kind of things that made him a fantastic baseball coach, but really didn't have all the inner workings of how athletic departments may work. So I was able to come in, uh, pull together a staff. Um, you know, Skip obviously had the final word. I said, hey, look, I want to hire Larry Williams. And he would say, really? Tell me about Larry Williams. And I'd tell him, and he goes, oh, okay, go ahead, hire Larry Williams. And that's how we built built our staff. So it was, it was really, it was a lot of fun. S- Skip um, really taught all of us. Um, people like Verge Osbury, who's the still at LSU, is the executive uh, as, as the de- deputy AD there. Herb Vincent, who's at um, the uh, SEC office. Um, Chris Howard, who's with NCA Enforcement. It's he he ingrained in all of us the idea that the customer is really really important. Hmm. And he was the first guy to to really um, talk about and 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 be hands on with with folks. And I, I'll never forget Skip was on the phone call one day. I'm in his office. My office was right next door. I mean, literally, he could pound on his uh, wall, and you know that was his signal. Hey, I need to talk to you because he didn't want to get up. He would just pound on, <laughs> pound on the wall. He's on the phone with someone, and he's listening, and he's listening. You can just hear on the other side of the phone this this fan just ranting and raving going on and on and on and skip finally said okay look you bought a ticket to that game right and the guy goes yeah i bought a ticket to that game he goes were you able to buy a coke yeah was it cold yeah did you buy a hot dog yeah was it hot yeah did we play yeah we're even (laughs) and he hung up the phone (laughs) oh my goodness i mean but it was just you know skip would would say look you you go to a movie if you don't like the movie do you call the producer and ask for your money back he goes well no and if you go to that many more of those that producer's movies and you don't like it you're just going to quit going so it's important that we have a great product that you know we serve our customers well as they come into to the game in any way shape or form uh that they get there whether it's a baseball game a women's basketball game men's football game whatever Uh, we need to treat them well so that customer service piece has really really stayed with all of us and particularly me you're basically the ad there no, well, you, you're you're more of an AD than than you would have been. Yeah, any, in you know ordinary. what? I, I will tell you that um, Skip did give great responsibility, um, but all of us, all of us would never make, or none of us, I should say, would ever make a decision without saying, "Hey, Skip, you good with this?" And you know, his trust in us was uh, implicit, and we never wanted to let him down. When did Saban get there? Was that Oat? No, he, Nick was there. He got there in 2000. 2000. He was already there when you got there. Yeah. And you worked really closely with football during um, your... Yeah. Yeah, myself and Verge. Okay. Verge, was a, uh, Verge Osbury was a former player. So there were certain former player type things that Verge would handle and then more business and things that I would handle. Nick Saban was quoted as saying this about you. The guy, the guy's just got the right stuff, not just about running a program, but also managing people. Um, what was your relationship with him like then? What did you pick up from him uh, in those days? The, the best thing about Nick was, you know, he was really black and white. You kind of knew where he stood. He was all about his coaches, all about his players, making sure that they had what they needed to be successful. And what I took away from there was really the the how um, a, a, a program should be pulled together. What are the necessary resources to to create a successful program. Um, why do you need these certain things to do that? And you were able to see the success that, that Nick was able to um, put together there. Um, you know, LSU, people don't, don't remember, but Nick got there in 2000. And, and in 1997 or 98, they sold like 24,000 season tickets. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all of a sudden, 2001 happens where they go to the um, – SEC championship game, and then the following year they had uh, kind of an up and down year because they had some some key injuries, and 
go to the Cotton Bowl. Wow, the Cotton Bowl. And then the following year is 2003 where they won the championship. And then all of a sudden, you know, LSU selling 60, 65,000 season tickets. And everybody thought that was always the case. But five years before that, (laughs) uh, they were struggling. Um, So we needed to make sure to capitalize on that. Um, and it's something certainly that Clemson had done here uh, with the seed equity program. And a lot of universities around the country were doing that at the time. Um, so it kind of, we were the folks that kind of helped roll that out and educate the people of Louisiana about that. And it's really been a, a, a big positive for them, just like it's been incredibly positive here at, at Clemson. I hate to fast forward through your entire Georgia Tech tenure, but that's okay. <laughs> really interested, really interested to hear. I think you've said that um, that even before the job came open here, Terry Don sort of confided in you uh, that hey, uh, I'm going to be stepping down at some point. When and where was that? When when he when he told you it that? was at one of our ACC meetings. I, I can't remember if it was the. April meeting prior to the spring meeting or the spring meeting, but it was one of those two that Terry Donna said, look, this is, I'm, this will be my last football season and we're going to kind of look for, for a replacement. And, and immediately after he said that, I said, well, Terry Don, I'd, I'd be honored you know, to be considered for that job because by that time and going to so many ACC meetings while I was at Georgia Tech, I'd gotten to know Dabo, I'd gotten to know Brad and, you know, there, they were, you know, they were great. And I said, you know, if I'm ever going to leave Georgia Tech, and I really enjoyed Paul Johnson and I, Danny Hall and the folks there. I mean, we had done some major facility um, things that uh, were, were done there. We were left with a little bit of a mess mm-hmm. financially there um, that we kind of uh, were, were able to really help. Um, in fact, uh, it was I think it was a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, there was a guy who uh, had, has been at, at Georgia Tech probably since the early 2000s. And when they redid the stadium and built their upper deck, they used a um, a financial uh, instrument called a derivative. Now, everybody knows that derivatives are bad. Uh, Well, derivatives uh, gave them a bunch of money up front, a bunch of cash up front. But if the market went a bad direction, like it did in the Great Recession of 2008 through 10, the school was kind of left there holding the bag. So we Mm -hmm. had to refinance a bunch of things. And we actually added $32 million worth of debt at Georgia Tech. Now think about this. $32 million worth of debt. That is half of Little John. Yeah. That's that's the entire South Club, Oculus, and North Suites renovation. $32 million worth of debt for which not one seat was built. Wow. It was just because the derivative had gone bad. So when we refinanced that uh, and added that to our debt service, um, myself and the VP of finance at the time, um, I convinced him, you know, hey, look, let's only do this. Let's do this with a 10-year look-in and see what we could see what the market is in 10 years. And if it's bad, we're going to have to come forward with the money. And we had a nice endowment at Georgia Tech, but uh, which has continued to grow. Um, but maybe we'll get lucky and interest rates will be low and we'll be able to flip this whole thing over. Well, two weeks ago, this guy calls me and said, we just closed on all of those bullet bonds Mm -hmm. that were out there and their debt service now has no balloons no it's all level set now at a rate that they can work with so you know when you're when you're sitting there and trying to make some of those decisions back then at a place that didn't have a lot of the financial uh, abilities that ipte has given to our department uh, you're kind of sweating a little bit but then you see the great market rise and, you know, a little bit of ups and downs. But really, uh, over the last 10 years has been a, a, a really positive uh, financial piece. And then to see that that piece came to fruition and really helped them. I mean, they, they now have a much more firm uh, debt structure than they had before. So that was that was something that, quite honestly, I'd forgotten all about, Larry. <laughs> and, and the guy called me two weeks ago and said, hey, this, this really kind of worked out wow. uh, for the positive. So when it does happen and it's announced that, that Terry Don's going to be stepping down, do you call 
President Barker? Like, how do you go? Actually, about- Terry Don did a lot of that. Okay, he, he goes, look, let me let me handle this on campus. Um, he goes, I want you to come up for a day, and you know, we'll get you in front of President Barker. And we did that, and then they went through the regular search, and you know, President Barker and Neil Cameron, Janie Hodge, and David Wilkins were all part of that, and of course, President Barker. And we did it the morning before a Clemson Georgia Tech football game mm-hmm. in in 2012, and then a couple of weeks after that, um, I was lucky enough to get the call to come here and be the 13th athletic director. Okay, so if, so they ask you, okay, what's your five-year vision? What was it? Well, you, you always, when you come into a new circumstance, you have to take some time and, and, and listen to the people who are here. Because no matter how much you think you know about a place from the outside, you don't really know it until you're inside it. So what are the things that are needed and necessary to move the program forward? I knew that, that Davo was an outstanding coach, and, and I also knew that Brad needed help from a facility perspective as well. So really, about six months after I got here, I went to the board with a five-year facility plan that attacked um, the stadium, from the South Club and the Oculus and Bridge and, and the – sweet area. And I knew that that was going to generate revenue, which would go to IPTE. We made a change here in the athletic department. Previously, all those dollars from suites and any club seats had kind of gone to the athletic department. We moved that all over to IPTE so that IPTE can create relationships with the people who were spending that money for those uh, for those premium seats. We then, you know, Dabo and I talked a lot about the Reeves facility. We we knew we had to do something at, at uh, Little John. So the football operations center, the club seats and Oculus, Little John, a tennis facility, and something for academics, baseball um, facility, and then something for academics really needed to be done within this five-year plan. So that was presented in July of 2013, and we nearly made it. Um, the last facility to open was tennis, mm-hmm. and that was last November. Um, so we were just a little bit off on the on the five year piece. Early 2013, you'd been on the job for a few months. You go to dinner with Dabo. Do you recall? Uh, I'm just well, wondering no, where, we, we, we where were you just got together. In, we were just in his office. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I yeah. read. I think I think it was Michael Smith's story that said you you went either way. You got together with him. Coming off 10 wins in 2011, 11 wins in 12, and you asked him, what's next? And that's when he, I guess, pulled out the napkin or whatever. The napkin, yeah. The napkin that when we opened the Reeves facility, I gave back to him. You, so you kept it? Oh, yeah. So he has it, I'm he sure, commemorated in his in his uh, office. Mm-hmm. What do you remember about that, I guess, your takeaway from, because uh, you, know, you really didn't know him that well, I imagine, but just the the, the vision that he had for... You know, years and years down the down the well, road. Well, I mean, first and foremost, Dabo, as we all know, um, is very focused at what he he wants, and he knew that this was the next step. They had just opened the indoor facility that Terry Don had been able to get done, and that was phenomenal. Um, that was a really big step. But Dabo always looked at that as a step. What what can go around it? What you know, that should be our home, the forever home of Clemson football around that area. So uh, it was shortly thereafter that we started to look at various options as to where we can go and place that forever home. And um, the best idea was that it should be down um, near the practice fields and in the indoor facility. And that's when we you know, moved the soccer practice fields and created, you know, their area and and soon to be uh, operation center that's going to go down there um, but it was it all kind of came together um, you know very very quickly as to yeah that's the place it needs to be mm-hmm. and okay now how big does it need to be what needs to be in it how is it going to be pulled together how are we going to pay for it and that's when we also started just um, shortly thereafter uh, with Davis Babb at, at Ipte the idea of the Cornerstone Partners and you know the idea of getting at least 10 people to give two and a half million dollars to help fund all the things that we were looking to do um and that was a different kind of thing at 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 clemson because you know clemson was always looked at as you know especially ipte you know it was a mile wide because of the, the the great support and the number of members that ipte had but it was about an inch deep 
There was there was not a lot of big dollar folks. Where at Georgia Tech, it was about a hundred yards wide and a hundred yards deep. There was a lot of um, really wealthy folks that had attachment to to Georgia Tech, but. Davis bought into it. We went out, and through his uh, fundraising staff, we were able to uncover incredible people who uh, wanted to give uh, to Clemson. And you know, led by Bill Hendricks, he was the first um, cornerstone. Dabo and 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 Bobby Couch and a few others went down to um, Bill's house, um, you know, on the coast. And uh, Bill said, "I want to win another national championship." And Dabo goes, I'm your best chance. <laughs> and, you know, that's where Bill um, signed on as the first cornerstone. And then we had Vivian Reeves um, who came forward and wanted to put her late husband Alan's name on the marquee building that had to do with football. Uh, and at that point in time, and I th- still think it is, um, the largest gift ever received by Clemson, you know, $12.5 million. Dan, I remember, I mean, this is 2013. You know, you're you're only a year removed from from putting up the practice facility. The West End Zone is still a really nice place, a home for football. And so, a lot of people are like, "Wait a minute, what are we doing?" You fast forward to now, and you look at a lot of your competitors, uh, Florida State, Florida, Auburn. They're still just talking about in the talk about phase right. of doing an operations facility. How crucial was just the the proactive? mindset in going ahead and doing it well i guess it's because why sit around and talk about something that you know is going to happen Mm. okay that you know has good financial bones to it you're investing in a a program that is returning a, a, a great amount of of notoriety and 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 financial well-being to the department and to the institution let let's keep investing in the good things and and move that forward and we were able to convince our president and the board that you know this is a good investment we invested not only in the facilities but we invested in people uh along the way uh and and that that resonated with that group, and I'll give you know President Clements and our board great uh, kudos in, in saying, you know what, um, this makes sense for Clemson right now, and we've been able to, and Dabo's done, and his staff have done a phenomenal job of um, you know making that what was a vision at the time really come true. You know, you we do projections all the time. You know, uh, Graham and Eric George and, you know, our whole financial staff and myself, because of my background, we're sitting here looking at, you know, where these dollars might go. And uh, those are projections. And we need to make sure that how we're investing helps those projections come true. And we were lucky enough to have that happen. Quick word about Uptown Realty LLC, headed up by Patrick Enzer former sports writer who decided to get into the real estate game. Uptown Realty locally owned and operated out of Sumter, but they serve the Eastern Midlands and PD area with the buying and selling of homes, commercial properties, and land. They also offer affordable new housing in the mid 130,000s from a local custom builder. Patrick is the sole owner and broker in charge. Grew up in Anderson, going to Clemson games, been in Sumter for 15 years. Loyal Tiger Illustrated subscriber, loyal Dubcast listener. Website is UptownRealtySC.com. If you run a business that conducts credit card transactions, with customers, you got to learn about tandem payment. Credit card processing company has offices throughout the Southeast, but the one in Greenville and the upstate, headed up by a 2005 Clemson grad, Tandem's technology allows business owners to offset their credit card processing costs by applying a small customer service charge to each sale they make. Tandem has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and was awarded the Better Business Integrity Award in 2013. Check them out at tandempayment.com. Somebody told me you enjoy going to Atlanta United games with your sons and and that you might have even picked up a few ideas from from, from a recent trip. Well, yeah. It was recently I went to uh, Atlanta United game, had the, the boys and, and Marcy, and we were all there, and it was just a fabulous experience. And, and it really hit me uh, when, I was, when I was there around the Mercedes-Benz Dome. Now, we don't have $1.5 billion to build a Mercedes-Benz Dome. Um, but it it was really clear to me, just looking at the audience that was there, that 
seven to 10 years from now, all those people that were there, those young people, and David Tepper, who owns the Carolina Panthers, is going to do exactly the same thing in Charlotte. Mm. Um, So within that seven to 10 year period, people who are coming to our campus are going to expect some of those same things. You know, the, the things outside the stadium, the entertainment, all of those sorts of things. It's it's about the game. It'll always be about the game, especially as it relates to Clemson football. But what are some of the add-ons that we can do? That Back to that customer service thing that Skip talked about years and years and years ago. It's still customer service. Why will people come here? You know, we want to make sure that you know, our parking lots are great and the things inside the stadium are great. But are there areas that we can create? spots for people just to hang out and have fun. Um, Because, yeah, we have 80,000 people that come to the game, but there's another 20,000 that just stay outside the stadium. Mm -hmm. You know, how how do we entertain them as well? Um, So those are always things, and I ask the staff whenever they go to, our marketing staff goes to a lot of uh, minor league baseball games or minor league hockey, and bring something back. Uh, Don't just go and and be a fan. Uh, Be a uh, be an, an active fan to bring a great idea back to us that we can try to implement here. Anything specifically you saw that sort of grabbed you? Well, right outside the um, Mercedes-Benz Dome was this probably 40-yard by 80-yard area where they had inflatables and food trucks and bands and artists and jugglers and just things where people who were, and there was, it's a very young crowd, the the ghost of those games they were just out there just having a great time you know an hour hour and a half before uh the start of the game and i started to think you know how can we do that here you know wh- where can we do that we're, we're so you know fixated on you know making sure that every blade of grass is parked on here and that's incredibly important but we've got to be able to look at places where we can do that sort of thing because in the not too distant future our crowd is going to be as i said earlier they're going to be looking for that as a part of their entertainment coming to a, a, a sporting event. This is a town of, what, 15,000 people, and two of the previous ADs live here. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Well, what's Different. really cool is within the last 48 hours, I've seen both of them. <laughs> um, you know, Terry Don was honored yesterday with the honorary alumnus from our um, – uh, alumni association so i got to see him and trish yesterday afternoon and i was in a meeting earlier this morning and all of a sudden i see uh bobby robinson walking down the hallway and jumped out of the meeting because i hadn't seen bobby in a few months and had a chance to bring him he- into the office here and uh, it's always great to connect with both of them um they were really you know bobby worked at georgia tech when I, when i got the job Uh, He was one of the associate ADs there. So um, he certainly taught me a lot about as I got into the Atlantic Coast Conference some things about the conference and uh, was and remains a a very, very dear friend. Seems like both of those, they're similar in that they're very detached. They're not in your business, but they're there as sounding boards if you need them. That's exactly right. And, you know, one of my great hopes is, even though I'm a, a little more type A than, than both of those guys, that when it's time for me to retire and, and, and hopefully stay around here in, in Clemson, that whoever sits in that chair afterwards, I'm the same way. Because I think that is just so important um, to be able to, to be a resource as needed or necessary. Do you ever sit back and marvel at, at your career, the coaches you've been around? I mean, you just we're just talking about Snellenberger, Jimmy Johnson, Nick Saban, even Jimbo Fisher, I guess, who you developed yeah. a relationship with there. Now, I guess Lou Holtz of South Carolina, now Dabo Sweeney. Yeah, it, it, and I don't want to forget Paul. Uh, True. Paul Johnson is one of the greatest. Uh, I mean, you can sit and talk with Paul if, if you know him. Okay, now, 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 Paul, Paul doesn't let a whole lot of people in the door, but if you got in the door, um, you know he's fantastic. He he really is, um, ultimate competitor, incre- incredibly intelligent. But yeah, Larry, I think that you know when you kind of sit back and sit on the back porch and say all the people that you've been able that I've had the good fortune of being around, um, it is it is special. Um. You've been pursued for at least one high-profile job, AD job, but you're still here. I've been told that that Marcy, your wife, would 
would not let you go anywhere. She loves it so much here. She does. Um, she really enjoys this area. And, you know, this job opportunity really came at a great time because we had just become empty nesters. Um, our youngest had just gone off to college. And, you know, a- Atlanta is probably not the mecca for empty nesters. <laughs> um, you know, this is much more uh, a- of a great environment to, you know, whether you we were fortunate enough to get a house on Lake Hartwell and um, to be able to go out every once in a while on the boat, or she loves to hike and paint, and she has a great canvas for which to do that here, and um, she really enjoys it. I've got to tell you that I knew, you know I don't know a whole lot about the area. I've learned more over the last few years than I did if we had this discussion in 2015. I know how to get from here to the house and back, um, but that's just that's just the way you know, I've always worked and, you know, it's, it's, it's important every once in a while. And I've learned this from a lot of different people. You've got to begin to enjoy what you're doing and, and take a little time and and recharge. You have a boat? We do. We have a little pontoon boat. I got, I got to rib you a little bit because I think your first few months here, I'm trying to break the ice and I'm like, Hey, where do you live? Lake Hartwell. Oh, do you have a boat? And you said, why would I want a boat? Yeah, well, I didn't buy Things the boat. Things have changed. I, I didn't buy the boat, okay? Um, my son and my wife bought the boat, and I came home one day, and there it was. Um, so that, I, I, did, I captain the boat now. I, I know how to drive it. I know how to park it. That's good. Um, That's good. So it's, it, it, it is a lot of fun, though. When you go home, what are you able to disconnect? Like, Yeah, for the most part. Uh, but, you know, it, it's when you have cell phones and things like that uh you you're, you're never totally disconnected we went to yellowstone um at the end of may and that was a disconnecting moment um because you're out in yellowstone and there's you and the bison and you know other types of animals but um you know you, you don't get the cell service but you know what i i love what i do and it's just part of who you are so if, if you're watching something, if I'm watching something on TV and, you know, I could relate it, you know, without six degrees of separation to something that could help us here at Clemson, you know, that's when the phone comes out and a note goes in. Um, it's, it's always about what is what we can do to make what we have here better because that's my job. And there's a lot of people here that have invested incredible amounts of time and money to be able to have a great experience, to, to watch you know, our sports programs be successful. We just finished our, our all-staff meeting today, and you know, I know our coaches have great goals for, and individual goals for each one of their teams. And my goal is every team makes the postseason. I don't know when that's been done here last um, I didn't have an opportunity to run into Tim Bure, um <laughs> to ask him that question. But I know it's been a long time uh, since every team made the postseason. And that's our goal. I mean, we've invested. Uh, we've given great, opportun- great facilities to our student athletes and our coaches. And it was by choice that we invested in those things first. Um, to make sure that they had great practice and, and playing and preparation areas. Uh, now, we did, as we talked about, Little John was kind of both, you know, with the Swan Pavilion and the renovation inside, and certainly anything we do inside Memorial Stadium is something that is going to help us generate revenue. But uh, we've done an awful lot of good things from a facility perspective, and, and, and hopefully now we have the – the coaches and the student athletes to be able to go out and and be successful in all of the sports we participate in. I know you had a hunch that Dabo was headed for big things when you took the job here. Still, do you marvel and are you amazed? Do you sit back at all at any time and consider that you are a part of a major chapter in college football history? You know, what looks to be one of the foremost powerhouses of college football history. Well, that's kind of you to say. I, you know, I talk to all of our administrators, and I say, look, we're, we, our jobs here are to support the student athletes and the coaches, and, and I and I firmly, firmly believe that. You know, Dabo was was going to be a success. Um, I knew that when I came here, 
uh, the level of his success, did we have a tiny bit to do with it? Well, maybe. Um, but you know, his greatest attribute is always looking forward. And you know, he talks about and has a lot of great visuals on the windshield mentality. But I will tell you, Larry, there's a lot of people that have cute sayings. There's a lot of people that you know have great looking T-shirts and big books to be able to w- impress um, you know a potential employer or whatever what their plan is. Um, but very very few follow through with it. Very very few have the internal drive and and things to be able to say no it, 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 we're not there yet we we we've, we've got more to do and I think one of the great things that he does is he looks at his football program not in t- totality. It's, hey, wow, here's the 124th edition of Clemson football, and there's 120 new guys here. How are we going to write that? And it's not just that he says it. He believes it, and he lives it, and that's the separator. A lot of folks, I mean, there they're are cute T-shirts all over the country, and and cute sayings, but very few people live it. Mm -hmm. And, and he does. And that's the separator that makes him great. Anything we haven't covered that, that you, that you'd like to. Gosh, I mean, this is, uh, you know, I like to blow leaves. Uh, That's like one of my favorite (laughs) fall activities, you know, because so many times when you're here at work, you have your list of things you want to get done, and then all of a sudden somebody lobs a hand grenade onto the table, and that kind of blows everything up for the day. But cutting grass, blowing leaves, because when you start it, it's a mess. When it's over, it looks like you did something. And you know those are, those are things that um, I, I enjoy that kind of stuff. Yeah. It, it's kind of, um, you know, it's mind candy a little mm-hmm. bit. Well, Dan Radakovich, uh this is the nicest an athletics director has ever been to me when I've blown the time of an interview and have been 15 minutes late and then gone, oh gosh, maybe almost an hour past the scheduled time. So I am indebted to you for that. Well, Larry, it was a lot of fun. I enjoy it. You know, this is a great gift to be here um, representing Clemson University in this particular job. And we not only have great student athletes and fans and administrators and board, but um, we have a great group of people that cover us. and, And you're at the top of the list. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Take care. Yeah, well, we scheduled this interview. I wrote the wrong time down. Uh, 30 minutes after it was scheduled to start. Worst feeling in the world to think that an interview is starting at 1.30 and then to get a call at 1.02 asking, hey, where are you? Well, I'm at home. Oh, my goodness. Nightmare. So Dan was unbelievably gracious and understanding uh, in, in, in the circumstance of, of, of my stupidity. So appreciate that. Appreciate our listeners. Appreciate all of our generous sponsors, including our title sponsor, Parm Smith and Argent Law Firm in downtown Greenville. Everybody have a wonderful day. Safe travels today, tonight, tomorrow, through the weekend. Enjoy college football on Saturday, and we'll be back next week. Take care.